We're joined now by Robert Mardini. He is the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. He joins us now live from Geneva. Geneva. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us in Al Jazeera. Now, in the last 24 hours, we've heard about two newborn babies at Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza who have died after a shell, an Israeli shell, shut down a generator which had been powering incubators in the neonatal ward. We know many other babies are also at risk now. How long can a newborn baby survive without being connected to an incubator? Well, these are unbearable um, uh, reports and images we're getting from Al-Shifa Hospital, but also from other hospitals, Al-Ransisi, Al-Quds Hospital, and many other hospitals where uh, the, the vicinity of hospitals become war zones, which is really unacceptable. And uh, we repeat our call to parties to the conflict that hospitals are sanctuaries. They need to be protected. They must be protected. Uh, no patient, no baby, no woman, no man should die in a bed hospital. No doctor, no nurse should, uh, should be killed in the line of duty. Those are uh, unacceptable things happening before our eyes today. It's worth highlighting to our viewers the pictures we are currently showing on the screen are those 20 or so babies that were connected to incubators but now can no longer be connected. I just want to ask my question again. H how long do they have to survive if they're not connected to the, uh, the, to the NICU? They are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And we have been saying very, consist very consistently for many days now that uh, one cannot unplug uh, uh, an incubator uh, and expect that a baby will be surviving. Uh, we know that hospitals need uh, fuel, electricity, uh, that severely injured people also uh, are extremely vulnerable and that uh, medical care should be protected. And clearly what you're seeing happening today in Gaza hospitals is, uh, uh, is uh, simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Parties to the conflict need to, uh, to, to do much more to protect civilians, to protect doctors, to protect the act of uh, of, of, you know, the, the life-saving act, act of, of, uh, uh, of, of doctors and nurses. Uh, Mr. Mardini, today we heard from the Palestine Red Crescent Society. They say Al-Quds Hospital, which is, again, one of the main hospitals in Gaza, that it's run out of fuel, it is no longer operational, but that their medical staff are still trying to treat patients without electricity. Can you tell us more about what is happening in Al-Quds and how difficult a situation these doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals must be facing? I mean, we received those reports from our colleagues from the Palestine Red Crescent Society that the hospital is uh, uh, no longer in a, uh, in a position to, to operate and uh, still there are uh, patients uh, requiring uh, critical services here and the doctors and nurses are certainly doing everything they can with the very limited means, uh, very often without anesthesia, without uh, electricity. Uh, we know of uh, doctors uh, treating with the light of their mobile phones, and not only, by the way, in Al-Quds Hospital, but for, in other hospitals as, as well. Working conditions are unbearable, uh, and the uh, nurses and doctors have been working around the clock now for a month uh, with, with limited support and with the uh, deteriorating working con conditions day by day, hour by hour, uh, and this situation is simply not tenable. And what are you hearing uh, from your uh, staff on the ground about military activity that is currently uh, underway around these hospitals and on these hospitals? Well, I mean, the reports are very stark. Uh, we are really facing an unbearable human tragedy that is unfolding in front of our eyes. Uh, this is what our colleagues on the ground are saying. People are approaching us uh, and are calling us uh, day and night, saying they are afraid uh, to open their door for fear of getting killed and, and pleading to help them to reach safety. So uh, what I feel from our teams on the ground is anger, it's frustration for not being able to respond to these calls uh, because uh, the, the working conditions are, are not there to be able to carry out safely those life-saving activities uh, in the worst of circumstances. Israel... Uh, and, uh, I, I, apologies for interrupting, but I, I just want to say that Israel continues to stand by uh, the fact that Hamas is embedded in tunnels under these hospitals, claims that hospital staff deny 
are hospitals fair game when it comes to the law of armed conflict? Well, hospitals are uh, to be absolutely protected uh, by all times. And I think the onus and the obligation is always on the parties to the conflict not to use hospitals to launch attacks or to use hospitals as a battle zone. Uh, this is very clear. Uh, and even if a hospital uh, is used by one party as a launching pad uh, for attacks, uh, it does not justify automatically uh, that a hospital be targeted at a time where uh, women, children, and men are being treated and the health personnel is delivering life-saving aid. So uh, those are sanctuaries that should be protected. And we reiterate our call to parties to the conflict to uh, to stay away from hospitals, to stay away from ambulances uh, evacuating critically injured, to stay away from uh, health personnel saving lives in the most difficult of, of times and circumstances. Benjamin Netanyahu has said in recent interviews that the Red Cross should be doing its duty, and I, I quote there, and checking on the welfare of the Israeli captives in Gaza. Is that something uh, the Israelis have approached you with? And how would that be facilitated? Well, we have been also extremely clear from the beginning that uh, uh, those hostages, civilian hostages, should be, uh, should be freed uh, urgently and unconditionally. Uh, we have repeated our ask to be visiting them, to check on their health, uh, to ensure that they get medicines, to also allow them to exchange messages with their uh, families. And we also uh, proposed uh, to facilitate any release of hostages so far. Uh, our teams were successful in uh, facilitating the release of four hostages. We are ready to do more of this, and this is uh, part also of our commitment. And at the same time, uh, our teams are committed to help uh, in the Gaza Strip um, amid uh, horrendous conditions uh, and unbearable suffering uh, the civilian population is living. And there is no hierarchy in suffering. There is no hierarchy uh, in uh, human dignity. And we call really on the humanity of uh, parties to the conflict to carve out a larger space for uh, impartial and neutral humanitarian action that is needed today more than ever. And if you did indeed visit uh, to check on the condition of these uh, captives, Israeli captives in Gaza, would you speak to the Israelis about doing the same thing for those Palestinians that are in, in jails in the occupied West Bank? I mean, absolutely, for us, uh, uh, a, a detainee is a detainee. Uh, uh, they require our visit, and we have been very consistent from the very beginning, and for many years, by the way, where we have been visiting uh, detainees on, on all sides of this conflict. And our plea remains the same. Uh, we need unconditional access to all detainees, including uh, the hostages uh, today in Gaza. Uh, we haven't been able to visit so far, but this is uh, a long-standing request and ask, and, uh, um, and we hope we will be able to visit them soon. 1.6 million people displaced, many people forced to live crowded in tiny spaces that are available. What are the risks of disease in the near future? Well, actually, we see now the visible scars of war, and this is uh, unacceptable. It's heartbreaking. It's terrifying to see, and what our uh, colleague surgeons are seeing today, day in and day out, uh, is, is simply unbearable. But there is also uh, a silent ticking bomb, which is uh, the public health, which is uh, the rising risk of epidemic uh, that is starting to play out in many places with the four out of the five wastewater treatment uh, plants in Gaza not operating, uh, and the wastewater flowing into the streets where uh, tens of thousands of displaced people are living in horrendous conditions. Uh, this is recipe for epidemics. Uh, we hope that uh, there will be enough wisdom to uh, de-escalate uh, this conflict and to allow um, humanitarian activities to take place uh, in better conditions uh, that it is the case today, where uh, I think our colleagues from the ICRC, our colleagues from the Palestine Red Crescent Society, and many other organizations 
present in Gaza are uh, are able only to do a fraction what is uh, of what is needed, and this is why it is absolutely critical to reiterate. Uh, the need to have sustained humanitarian aid getting into the Gaza Strip to, to also get uh, enough regular, predictable humanitarian poses to allow first people to get access to services and humanitarians to be able to carry out their work. Mr. Mardini, just briefly, one more question for you. You are the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. You have lived through many a humanitarian crisis. Have you ever experienced or seen a situation like this in Gaza? I've been indeed many times in Gaza, whether during um, uh, previous uh, rounds of escalations or in the immediate aftermath. Uh, and I think uh, from what I hear from my colleagues today on the ground, what we dare witness to uh, is uh, not comparable by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the level of despair, the level of uh, anger, the level of frustration, of human suffering, uh, is reaching uh, alarming levels. And I think this should be a moment uh, for the international community to, to get its act together and to ensure that uh, a space for humanity is carved out in the middle of this mayhem. Robert Mardini, Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, thank you for your time.